Betuabwe. In the Chaluba language of South Central Congo, when a speaker recognizes kinsmen and kinswomen among him, he greets them Betuabwe, and they respond to him. If they recognize him as their kinsperson, Betu. Betuabwe. Amen. Our first act tonight, then, is to recognize each other as kinspeople, father of the same tri- children in the same tribe of Jesus Christ. Greetings to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We welcome you to this place and this time with the issues that we face, with the resources in this room and beyond in the global church. My name is Hunter Farrell. I'm the director of the World Mission Initiative of Presbyterian of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. It's a unique effort that started as a dream among a few uh, Christians here at the seminary who dreamed of a way to connect students with what God is doing in the world. And since that time, 21 years ago, we have sent 961 students into intercultural spaces in this country and around the world. They've seen lives and ministries transformed through the power of Jesus Christ as they see the gospel translated into contexts that are new for our students. WMI has grown to include training and cultural proficiency in the seminary and other church bodies, and beginning next February, we will inaugurate the first cohort in the Graduate Certificate for Missional Leadership, and we look forward to greeting new students at that time in February. To all of you, uh, both here in this room and the, uh, I think, double our number online, we say a hearty thank you and welcome. As we gather for this conference, though, on missional leadership in a time of disruption, I want to invite you to look in your program booklet at page 12. You'll see a colorful list of churches. Uh, You'll see a colorful list of congregations, presbyteries, and other judicatories, other churches. You'll see them from Iowa, Alabama, Virginia, Indiana, Tennessee, and Western Pennsylvania. You'll see Presbyterian churches, Redstone and Washington Presbyteries, the Southwest Pennsylvania Lutheran Synod, and the Episcopal Diocese of Pittsburgh. You'll see Living Waters for the World and the Presbyterian Foundation, who together have joined together to make this conference possible. We're grateful to them, and we're able to have this conference free of charge for all participants because of their generosity and faithfulness. We give thanks to our sponsors for supporting us tonight. But let me center us, if I could. Two years ago, in the height of the COVID-19 epidemic, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, we virtually gathered hundreds of churches, groups, and watch parties to think together through the WMI conference on issues of race and mission with Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil, Reverend Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove, and with Dr. David Camp. This year, we're grateful to God that we can gather in person this year and gather as we listen to the Reverend Eugene Cho, who will lead us to think together about the kinds of leadership we need in this church of all of ours that we might lead in times of disruption. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you tonight the Reverend Dr. Aza Lee, the president of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, and a leader who for me models the kind of adaptive, courageous, and resilient leadership so needed in theological education in this country today. Will you join me in welcoming Dr. Lee? Thank you, Hunter. Good evening. evening. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the community of the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. I'm excited to have the opportunity to greet you all in person. It has been uh, some time when I arrived here in June of 21, the campus was a ghost town. But I am so glad to see the activity and the opportunities uh, to welcome people back to campus. In fact, I was just thinking this week Uh, as I uh, came to campus today, I said, why am I so tired? And I realized that we've had an event here every day this week. So it feels like in some respects that we've returned to the past, but we all know that things will never return to what they used to be. 
And so I'm excited to welcome you here and thankful to the leadership that uh, Hunter provides to WMI and the ways in which you all participate in helping us to live out our educational mission. Pittsburgh Seminary has, for the better part of 230 years, been a leader in thinking through what the church needs, whether that is clergy in the frontier of the early 18th and 19th, early 19th century here in Western PA, or thinking about issues of mission, or leadership, or formation, or simply being faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm excited to be the leader here, but excited to join a team of individuals, of faculty and staff, partners, donors, board members, and church friends, partnering together to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ at the edge of what God is asking us to do. We have a great conference planned for you all. We have a great speaker to Reverend Cho. We're excited to have you here and the opportunity to celebrate with each of you what God is doing in our midst and a good faithful conference always wrestles a bit. And I imagine looking at the list of speakers and who we have lined up, you're going to be wrestling. We're all going to be wrestling. So, thank you for your time, thank you for your presence, and above all, thank you for joining us in this year's conference. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I want to take a brief moment to thank the members, uh, both students and uh, pastors, who uh, participated in this year's uh, WMI conference planning. This group met uh, for more than a year, uh, monthly, uh, for several hours to pull together this conference, and I'm greatly uh, appreciative of their work. Um, the Reverend Dennis Molnar is, has been our chairman, our fearless leader for the year, and his car, sorry, his, uh, his car fell apart in Erie, Pennsylvania this afternoon, and he's unable to be with us. So in the spirit of his resilient and flexible leadership, we're flexing uh, tonight even here. But we greet him online. He's with us online, along with perhaps 100 other uh, colleagues uh, online. Um, we also had representatives from the PTS student body and our alums uh, and presbyteries in the area. Um, as I call your name, would you please stand? I just want to recognize you. Abby George, Hannah Osland, Simeon Rogers, Felicia Zamora, from Redstone Presbytery, Skiff Hofsker, Pittsburgh Presbytery, Ralph Lowe, um, also uh, Pittsburgh Seminary staff members, Helen Blyer, Lisa Bunting, uh, Scott Hagley, Bala Kellep, and Kendra uh, Smith. We also want to give a shout out, we'll we never see him, but um, Bobby Jarselik is our IT person and makes this conference possible. Yeah. Wherever he is, we give him thanks. And he's, he's manning a lot of complicated Zoom work tomorrow as we carry this conference and its workshop. Thank you all, you can be seated, as he carries that out into the, the hinterlands. Um, one thing we do well at Pittsburgh Seminary is collaborate together. The seminary's continuing education department, ably led by my colleague, Dr. Helen Blyer, works closely with WMI for this biennial joint event. The W. Don McClure Lecture, on the one hand, which serves as the keynote of our, uh, con our biennial conference, the WMI Mission Conference. Here to share more about the mission legacy of Don and Lida McClure is Dr. Helen Blyer. Helen. Welcome. It is so good after so long to see so many of you. It's, it's a delight. Um, we are wel delighted to welcome you here. Um, I did the math, Hunter. This is the 40th W. Don McClure Lecture since 1982. And we are so happy not only to be gathering in person and online, but to continue our collaboration between the McClure Lecture and the WMI Conference. Um, as Continuing Education Director, I'm always charged with doing a couple of small <coughs> housekeeping things before we begin. So I'd like to both acknowledge those of you who are here in the chapel space with us, 
and those of you, our friends who are online. Um, at the conclusion of our lecture, we will, of course, have question and answer. We've got microphone over here set up for those of us who are in the sanctuary space. Those of you who are online, please use the Q&A pod in webinar. Um, you can chat in the chat. I'll be sitting over here at a computer talking to you during the entire conference. Use it robustly to comment on things, engage with each other, but please use the Q&A pod if you actually have questions that you would like to ask so they don't get lost in the larger conversation. So back to our introductions. We are so pleased in continuing education to now have this particular lecture as a key element in the Biennial World Mission Initiative Conference. It's a perfect fit. You see, the lecture is named in honor of Don McClure, a member of the class of 1934. Together with his wife, Lida, he served as a missionary in Ethiopia and the Sudan for nearly 50 years. They were both hardy, resilient pioneer evangelists, and their lives were dedicated to sharing the good news of the gospel in ways that met the people they worked with where they were. This included a task of overseeing the translation of the Bible for the first time into the Anuak language spoken by the people with whom they worked. Unfortunately, Don died violently at the hands of guerrillas in 1977. This lecture was established five years later in his memory. Our own P.C. Rossin Professor of Church History Emeritus, Charles Partee, who was also Don McClure's son-in-law, wrote a history of the McClure's work called Adventure in Africa. Should you be interested, it is available on Amazon for your Kindle. So now I'd like to invite my colleague, Dr. Scott Hagley, who will be installed in just a few weeks into the W. Don McClure Chair of World Mission and Evangelism. And he will be introducing our speaker. Thank you. Good evening. It's uh, my great pleasure uh, this evening to introduce our uh, McClure lecture for this year, uh, the Reverend Eugene Cho. Um, we normally, you know, for the McClure lecture, we, um, we meet and we kind of dream about who we'd like to learn from, um, who we think um, is writing or doing things in the world that we want our community here to learn from. And, um, you know, we're targeting, you know, people that um, are leading mission leaders. You know, they're, 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 they're out on the edge in terms of leading mission. Or maybe sometimes we're looking for an entrepreneur, you know, a mission entrepreneur. Um, often we're looking for a mission theologian. Um, we almost never get someone who checks all of those boxes. Um, but uh, tonight, um, we, we have uh, Reverend Cho, who, um, as a uh, mission leader, um, is currently the CEO and president of Bread for the World and the Bread Institute, a prominent nonpartisan Christian advocacy organization that urges both national and global decision makers to end uh, hunger in the United States and around the world. And as an entrepreneur, as a social entrepreneur, he's the founder and visionary of One Day's Wages, a grassroots movement of stories and people and actions to help alleviate extreme global poverty. The vision of One Day's Wages is to create a collaborative movement that promotes awareness, invites simple giving of One Day's Wages, and supports sustainable relief efforts through partnerships, especially with smaller organizations in developing regions. As an as entrepreneur, he uh, planted and he led uh, Quest Church in Seattle, an urban, multicultural, multi-generational church up until 2018. And as a mission theologian, he's written two acclaimed books, Thou Shall Not Be a Jerk, which I, I'm just saying, maybe for next year we have another invitation. Um, I don't have anybody in mind, but... Um, a Christian's Guide to Engaging po Politics, uh, published in 2020, and Overrated, Are We More in Love with the Idea of Changing the World Than Actually Changing the World, published in 2014. 
Reverend Cho is honored as one of 50 everyday American heroes for his entrepreneurial work. He is also a recipient of the uh, 2017 Distinguished Alumni Award from Princeton Theological Seminary, as well as the Frederick Douglass 200, a list of 200 people around the world who best embody the spirit and work of Frederick Douglass. Reverend Cho, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Please join me in offering a warm welcome to Reverend Cho. Give me one second to uh, situate myself here. Uh, what a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you so much. This is a, a tremendous honor. And um, uh, it's always weird when um, these bios that I have requested my staff not to send out keeps getting sent out. Um, <laughs> so uh, if they're listening right now, please don't send out that bio. Um, it's always weird hearing it, uh, but thank you so much. Uh, and uh, maybe before I start, I, I do want to take a moment to again thank uh, President Lee for his graciousness in inviting me to Pittsburgh, uh, Dr. Farrell and Dr. Blyer as well. And uh, the planning team of the conference, I know there are many, many names, probably not enough time to go through all of them, but thank you again so much for hosting me. Uh, and I want to just uh, thank all of you. Uh, I'm not sure if this has come into your voc vocabulary in recent uh, days or weeks, but first time in three years. Uh, that has come up in conversation many a times in the last uh, two months for me. Uh, first gathering, uh, first convening, uh, first conference, uh, first family group meal, uh, that has been uh, very life-giving, but also awkward, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, as an introvert to begin with, uh, the last two and a half, three years have made me even more socially awkward. And as a result, uh, I think we're all learning what it means again to be people and to be human and to be good neighbors and to be the church and to be community once more. But I am really delighted to be here with you. Um, I have the honor of serving as the president of Bread for the World. This sermon is not meant to be a, an advertisement for bread. Uh, tomorrow I'll be hosting a breakout with one of my colleagues on offering of letters. But I do want to just introduce uh, to uh, well, one person, uh, my board member who's here joining me, Joyce Rothermall. Joyce, do you mind just standing here? Joyce is a, a board member at Bread, someone that's very well known in the larger Pittsburgh area, and so I'm so delighted that you're here. Give her a big round of applause. Uh, Joyce has a booth for Bread for the World. Please keep her busy, test her with hard questions, and uh, uh, we hope to be able to see you there. If you would just join me in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Gracious God, thank you again so much for the privilege, the honor that it is for us to gather together. God, we ask, we beseech the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to be with us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. I want to confess to you that one of the first questions that I asked when I got to this space here is, is there a clock for me? Uh, and they said no. And I said, this is really dangerous. Uh, for any preacher, that's just a dangerous thing. And so I've got my, my phone here, and I've been given uh, about 45, 50 minutes here. And the reason why I say this is as that I've been preparing and praying for this one keynote. Uh, I'm wrestling with three sermons in this one message because there's just so much that you want to share. Uh, not to say that I have all the answers. Uh, I'm not quite sure uh, what is meant that I check all the boxes because there are many boxes that I'm still trying to figure out myself. But because the task at hand for us, what is missional leadership in disruptive times, in a time of disruption? And so I think we can talk about disruption 
It's one of those cool key words that everyone is saying right now. Certainly, we have to talk about what it means to be a people of mission, a part of the Missio Dei, people that are on mission, missional, and then I think we can certainly talk about what it means to embody good leadership during these times. So I'm going to jump all over the place, if I may, and focus on those three things, but I wanted to maybe... um, uh, point you to one particular passage that has meant uh, very much to me in the past two and a half years. Uh, Like you, the last two and a half, three years have been tremendously challenging. I still recall a Monday during the first stages of the month of March when I flew from Seattle to D.C., red-eye flight, to get to D.C. in time to meet the board of Bread for the World for my final interview. Uh, Thankfully, after multiple hours, they said yes, met the staff on Tuesday and Wednesday, left D.C. on Thursday, and then I didn't see my staff for about 18 months. Strange times. So much that I could say, but the passage that I have been thinking and reflecting upon so much the past couple years comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 21. And I'm not going to read the entirety of that last chapter in the Gospel of John, but I do want to point you to verse 3 of that chapter. John chapter 21, verse 3 simply says, this is Peter speaking, Peter says, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, they referring to the six other disciples that were present with him at this particular narrative, and they say, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night... They caught nothing. There are two reasons why I love this story. Uh, The first reason is I'm a big outdoors person. I may not look it in my suit, but when I put on my camo and go fishing or hunting, I love the outdoors. I love hiking, which is the reason why I'm not sure if there's a more beautiful place during a Seattle summer day. The topography of the lakes and the mountains. Pittsburgh is beautiful too, but man, the oceans and the lakes and Mount Rainier. The second reason why I love the story, besides the first one, uh, and I should note that as part of my uh, love for the outdoors, I'm an avid fisherman. One of these days, I dream about becoming a pro bass fisherman with a little decal on my left vest with Pittsburgh Theological Seminary as one of my sponsors. (laughs) I'll be like the Tim Tebow of fishing. And so every time there's a fishing story, I love it. I'll share more about this. But the second reason why I love this story is that underneath what appears to be an innocent story of Peter and the disciples simply going fishing because they're bored or they have nothing else to do, when you actually study and exegete and deep dig deep into the story, there's a reason why theologians and pastors believe that what this story really is about is about exhaustion, it's about cynicism, it's about disruption, it's about grace, and it's about God not giving up on his disciples. In fact, that line, I'm going out to fish, that it likely means I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I want to go back to what I was doing before I encountered this man named Jesus. 
Uh, perhaps another line that comes to mind for me is something that if I can be honest and candid, I have said hundreds of times since saying yes to the call to be a pastor. And many a times in the last two and a half years, and it goes like this. This, Lord, is not what I signed up for. Uh, let's just be honest. How many times in the past two and a half years, when you're staring into that Zoom computer roomy thingy, and you've been speaking for a minute, and people are saying, uh, you're on mute, you're on mute, you're on mute. <laughs> How many a times as we've struggled with isolation and loneliness, how many a times have we struggled with the decluttering and the deconstructing process and the disruption? Uh, let's just take a moment to just speak about just the litany of some of the things that we've collectively experienced as human people. This pandemic, an unprecedented global pandemic leading to illnesses and deaths. Yesterday I was speaking to a group of pastors in the Bay Area and when I asked for a show of hands of people that know someone close in their life that passed away, at least 60-70% of hands went up. I had an uncle pass away. The economic impact and joblessness, businesses lost. Masks and vaccines and boosters and the debates that go on in these things. I can't tell you the number of conversations I've had with pastors who have said that this has been some of the most difficult times of leadership. No offense to Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, but uh, at, least, at least for me when I was at Princeton, there were no lessons on these things. The most contentious election season in modern American politics. The insurrection of January 6th, in which we also saw and should name that Christian symbols and verses that are sacred to us were co-opted for violence. The social unrest and protest, the trauma and pain for our black and brown sisters and brothers, the George Floyd, the Ahmaud Arbery's, the Breonna Taylor's, the list is too long. The rise of anti-Asian hate in this nation and around the world. About a year and a half ago, I had one of the most difficult arguments with my father. My father now is 86 years old, still hanging in there, doing his walks, going fishing when he can. But about a year and a half ago, we got into probably one of the most spirited arguments in which we both wept. Not proud of screaming at him at the top of my lungs, but I was so furious. We were arguing because one random day, my father comes to me in urgency and says, Eugene, I need your help. I need to buy a gun. Um, 아버지 미안하지만 초, 총을 왜 필요합니까? Father, why in the hell do you need a gun? And I'll never forget these words. He said, I need to protect your mother and myself. Uh, that when you see Again and again, hundreds of times, images of Asian elderly being harassed or attacked and at times killed, it does something to your psyche. The strained relationships within families and churches. Afghanistan, the war in Ukraine, 
the injustice and pain, genocide going on in places like in Tigray and Ethiopia, hunger in Yemen and South Sudan and Myanmar, and the list goes on. 115 more million people expected to move into extreme hunger category. 50 million people on the brink of famine around the world right now. In this nation, the wealthiest nation where we have approximately 9 to 11 million children uncertain about where their next meal comes from. In this world, every 11 seconds, a child created in the image of God who perishes because of the complexities of malnutrition. And then, of course, Many of us may have forgotten it, but for some, it is seared into our conscience. The violence in Buffalo and in Uvalde. Can you imagine if that was the end of the conference? Thanks for coming. We'll see you next year. So as the people of God, is there a word for us? What does missional leadership look like in disruptive times? Friends, depending on time, we'll go through some of these points that I want to share with you. But the first thing that I want to share with you is that this is not the first nor the last of disruptive times. For us, we know that it feels like the foundations underneath us are moving, but I simply consider the time, the cultural, societal, political context that existed when in God's sovereignty, Jesus enters into human story. To give you a glimpse of that context, we know, for example, that there was so much abuse and injustice and division between adults and, and Jews and Gentiles and women and men and slave and free folks, and the list goes on and on. There was religious corruption, political upheaval, and oppression. It was disruptive. But we know something about Herod the Great from the book of Matthew where he orders the murder of all boys under two years and under because of his paranoia of his power. He was so paranoid in his leadership that he had three of his own sons murdered. One of his ten wives murdered. And of course, there were countless others. Caesar Augustus issues a decree for a census, as you're familiar with in the Nativity story, but he does it not because his motivation is to lead people in better ways, but simply to be more able to accurately tax people. Why? Because he had a vision of a military building expansion for overall larger imperial dominance control that they called the Pax Romana, his version of make Romana great again. The people of God, they've experienced oppression, experiencing rule under Egyptians and Syrians and Babylonians and Persians and Greeks and Romans. And we know that time between the Old and New Testament where 400 years of apparent silence. That was a disruptive time. And I say this not to diminish what we're going through, but to let you know there have been many a disruptive times before us, and there will be disruptive times ahead. And yet we know that it was in that moment that Jesus enters into human story in what feels like apparent silence 
behind the scenes, God still at work. And, and friends, I'm not sure what theological or denominational background that you come from. I know there are nuances in our theological views, but my hope and belief and exhortation is that even in times of apparent silence or chaos or disruption, may we not forget that God is still at work. In fact, in that story in John chapter 21, I guess as theologians and seminarians, our training is to analyze and exegete and look at all of the different perspectives. And I've done that many a times until recently I realized I think I've missed the most important part of that story, and it's this. Jesus is alive. This Jesus, who was crucified, is now alive. And John 21 tells us that this is the third time he appears to the disciples. There's a uh, recording of 12 instances in which the resurrected Jesus appears in the scriptures. I love how Jorgen Moltmann, in his seminal book about hope called The Theology of Hope, simply says... Our faith rises and falls on the resurrection. That in the past two and a half years, not meant to be a crutch statement, but to be reminding myself again and again that despite the chaos and disruption of our society, nation, or world, may we not forget that Jesus Christ is alive that the tomb is still empty. I know it's not Resurrection Sunday. I know we're not wearing our Easter best, our hats, our colorful dresses and wardrobes and suits and jackets, but every time we gather together, may we profess, confess, rejoice, and place our hope in this good news that Jesus Christ is alive, that He is who He says He is, and that he will accomplish what he said he will accomplish. I know this is something that we all know, but I've come to learn that sometimes it's the most basic things that we take for granted. Jesus is alive. And it's for that reason then that part of what it means to have missional leadership in disruptive times is how do we be people who cling onto hope? Amen. How are we people of hope during these times when there is hopelessness, when it feels like there's a bankruptcy of hope in our culture, when it feels like people or the culture operate on the currency of fear-mongering? What does it mean for us to be people of hope? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 to 25, urges us simply with these words, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Uh, you see, friends, a hope isn't blind to optimism. It's not naivete or ignorance. Hope isn't meant to be uh, a call for us to be uh, clappy, clappy, giddy, giddy, where we ignore the mess, the anxiety, the heartbreak, the lament, the grief in our world and even in our own lives. This is why I think it's so important for us to remind ourselves again of these words from the theologian Jürgen Moltmann who says that genuine hope is not blind optimism. It is hope with open eyes which sees the suffering and yet believes in the future. This is why it's important for us even and especially as people of hope, 
that we live as followers with our eyes and ears open to the disruption and the pain and the brokenness around us and even inside of us. Lament is a Christian discipline, a Christian worship that we often tend to push aside when it should be such an integral part of what it means to come to God in vulnerability and honesty. A third of all psalms, as you know, are lament. We have a book in the Old Testament called Lamentations. Amos and Jeremiah and Isaiah, there are numerous elements of worship that reflect lamentations. Jesus' last days are full of lament. So what is missional leadership during disruptive times? It's simply a call for you and for me and an encouragement for us as leaders to give people permission to bring their full, authentic self to God in worship and in leadership. When I was a a youth leader many years ago, Uh, There was a a church in Sacramento, California, where I would drive as a college student at UC Davis. I'd drive about 25 minutes to serve at this church, and it was a a Presbyterian church. And there was a big sign, a large banner, that was so visible, so large, that you couldn't miss, miss it, And every time you entered into the sanctuary, which was, I'm sure, the point of the designers of this building, you would see it, notice it, and be reminded of its message. But man, I really dislike that message. I know they had good intent, but the message on this big banner as you walked into the sanctuary, simply said, leave your worries outside before you enter the house of God. Again, I understand probably their good intentions, but it's this idea that in our relationship with God, if the church is only a place where we fabricate happy, giddy, clappy messages, then where do people go that are struggling with the realities of life? This is why I think God convicts the heart of the prophet Amos where God says, I hate your religious feasts. I hate these songs that you sing because when they're detached from suffering and injustice and oppression, what it ends up doing is, it's just a show. And God's saying, I don't want to play games with your show. So for those who are here, for those who are watching online, I'm very confident God can handle your worries. God can handle our sense of chaos during these times. If you're feeling ill-equipped, join the club. If you're feeling a little discouraged and despondent, join the club. If there have been times you've said, this isn't quite what I signed up for, I am the president of that club. (laughs) Join the club. So missional leadership in disruptive times requires vulnerability, not just for you, but we give others space for that vulnerability. The third thing that I want to share from missional leadership, as I maybe go back to our story from John chapter 21, there's so much there, that's a sermon in itself, but I love the fact that in this story, the disciples don't know who this voice belongs to. It's a stranger's voice initially. 
And so while there are things that we can critique about the disciples, I do appreciate that as the story unfolds, they eventually learn that it's the voice of their master. So what's our takeaway? Friends, not only are these chaotic times, the reason why it's partly chaotic, for many reasons, but one of it is because I contend this is the noisiest time in human history. It is the noisiest time in human history and we tend to monetize and to somehow celebrate those who are loudest or the outrageousest, if there's such a word. It is all over. Which then we begin to realize Jesus' intentionality and commitment to withdraw, to retreat, and to pray. I can just imagine his disciples, his PR team, his right, left-hand people saying, this person wants to speak to you, this person wants some of you, this person wants to amplify you, this person wants to platform you. Man, Jesus could have gone real big. And yet he chooses to withdraw, to retreat, and to pray. And friends, the takeaway lesson for us may be more important than ever before. Please heed this well, is we need to learn again to listen to the voice and the movement of the Holy Spirit. Whatever that may mean for your theological background or denominational background, it's clear to us that in the noisiest time in human history where we have messages going left and right on all of our devices, that we've got to hear and make time for that sacred space. As this story unfolds, I find it to be very comical that Jesus asks This question, friends, haven't you caught any fish? Which I want you to know is the worst question to a fisherman that's caught nothing. (laughs) And the interesting part about that story is that it's a ridiculous question, respectfully. It's a ridiculous question, I say, because... We know that Jesus already knows. So in other words, anytime Jesus asks a question in the Gospels, we should assume it's not for his benefit. If Jesus was here today, he wouldn't ask you a question because he doesn't know. It's because when he asks questions, Jesus is trying to teach us a glimpse of the kingdom of God and his character. So so for example, remember that story in the Gospel of Luke, this woman who's been suffering from internal bleeding for 12 years, and as a result, she's now stained and dirty, and as a result, she's marginalized. She's she's an embarrassment to her community and her family. She's unable to enter even into a house of worship because she's dirty. And in her desperation, she's working, worming through the crowd in her mind thinking, if only I can touch Jesus, I will be healed. She touches Jesus and the power of God heals her, praise God. And then Jesus asks a ridiculous question. Who touched me? Friends, seriously. Do you think Jesus responded like this? Ah! Who touched me? Or is it possible that in asking this question, Jesus wanted this woman to know? This woman unseen. This woman oppressed, marginalized, forgotten. That Jesus wanted in that sea of people, especially the men, including the disciples, in a misogynistic culture to know that in the kingdom of God, the king stops and says, I see you. Friends, in some ways, I, 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 
feel like we could translate the gospel as saying, the Lord sees you. So what's Jesus asking when he says, friends, haven't you caught any fish? You have to trust me in my exegesis here. I am taking some liberties. But I want you to know that I'm very confident that these disciples, especially Peter, they were pro-fishermen. They fished the Sea of Galilee, not tens, not hundreds, but thousands of times. They know the best spots, the best techniques, the best methods, the best times. Earlier, I shared with you that I love fishing. Whenever I have time, I especially love to engage in freshwater bass fishing. I've got a five, six lightweight rod. I've got a six foot rod. I've got a six, six rod. I've got a seven foot rod. I've got a seven, six foot rod. And then occasionally if I go saltwater fishing, so my father loves salmon fishing, from the beach we'll use eight to 10 feet salmon steel head rods. I've got a spin caster, I've got bait casters. For lures, depending on temperature, on water clarity, depending on the season, depending on how much weeds or foliage exists, I could do top water, I could use plastic worms like the Texas rigs, the Carolina rigs, the, the Neko rigs, the Wacky rigs, the Ned rigs. And then if I want to go deep with my lure for presentation for fish that are looking for cooler water under 8 feet, I've got lures that go 6 feet, 12 feet, 18 feet deep crankbait. My point is here, I'm a better fisherman than you. <laughs> So what's God trying to tell these professional fishermen? God's saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. And what a challenging world, a word for our times, where even we, as Christian leaders, missional leaders, it's so tempting to elevate our gifts. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. The next point that I want to make, friends, is that in our commitment to missional leadership is that we've got to be committed to the whole gospel. The whole gospel. And this might challenge some, I'm not sure, but for me, as I study the scriptures, the whole gospel is not just Jesus' walk to Calvary on Golgotha, but it's also Jesus' walk through Samaria. The whole gospel is that Jesus is Lord. Now, in my faith tradition, Growing up with the hybrid of going to a Methodist church, then a Presbyterian institution, going to non-denominational churches. For me, the whole gospel is I believe that Jesus is Lord and that Jesus, out of his love and grace, still pursues humanity, desires to be in relationship with God. That the truth is not merely propositional truth, but is personified in the person of Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. that Jesus saves. I'm so grateful that at the age of 18, I was working at my mother's small little deli shop inside a little building or a building called an IBM building in Sunnyvale, California. She had a little tiny deli shop there serving sandwiches for people. And it was in that summer I was forced to work there and I did not enjoy myself, but as I look back, I'm so grateful because in that summer, I met someone named Remando Gonzalez. Remando Gonzalez spoke very limited English, incredible person, so gracious, so gentle. 
was married, had a one-year-old son, and got to become friends with him. And as I look back, I almost wonder if I labored through Spanish throughout high school to be able to engage in friendship and to hear the gospel from Remando. Remando in Spanish would come up to me and says, Eugenio, my name in Spanish, Eugenio, tú necesitas a Cristo en tu corazón. You need Jesus Christ in your heart. Uh, for those who are Spanish speaking here, you, you estudié español por cuatro años durante la secundaria con Señora Nicora. Amen. Una profesora increíble. And I, and I look back, and every single day, Remando would share one Bible verse with me every day. Every day, even though I didn't ask for it. But every day, he would come to me and says, Eugenio. And I remember one where he says, Yo soy el camino, la verdad y la vida, le contestó Jesús. Nadie llega al Padre sino por mí. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. And friends, that summer, in my human finitude, with all my questions and all my limitations, I made a decision to follow Christ. I know it sounds strange in our even disruptive times when, according to a Barna report, 47% of millennial Christians believe that evangelism is wrong, compared to 27% among Gen Xers and 19% among boomers and some today who believe that evangelism and witnessing is violent. And certainly, part of justice work and truth-telling is that we have to tell the truth with harm that's been done in the name of Jesus, in the name of missions and missiology. Yes, absolutely. But I also pray that as we confess and repent, we also still stay committed to the message that God loves the world and that Jesus desires to reveal himself to you. Friends, my great-grandfather was one of the first people in his small little city or town or village to say yes to Jesus. It was probably in the late 1800s, early 1900s. I'm not sure of the exact time frame. And I'll say this as respectfully but candidly. I'm not sure who these people were, but there were these crazy Protestant missionaries <laughs> who got into a boat, convicted by the good news of Jesus Christ, sailed across the world in boats that took much longer than, than they do today. And they came onto the peninsula of Korea. They arrived in this village outside of a larger city called Pyongyang, the capital city of North Korea today. And they had a conversation with my great-grandfather who was so moved by the gospel of Jesus, he said yes. He goes home and in his inability to fully articulate it, shares the good news of Jesus with my great-grandmother and she says yes to Jesus. And our whole household comes to faith. Yes, there have been harm done in the name of missions and missiology. Yes, we have to repent and name forms of colonization and colonialism that have taken place. We can do that and also acknowledge that there have been faithful women and men trying to graciously, lovingly share about the good news of Jesus Christ. I share that because I want you to know that I don't believe that such a thing as uh, a self-made person exists. Uh, meaning, no one is an island to themselves. Someone prayed for you, encouraged you, loved you, mentored you, and I stand here because I'm not sure who they were, but I'm so grateful that there were these women and men in obedience to the Holy Spirit chooses to go and speak and also embody the whole gospel. Uh, these missionaries not only brought scripture but lived out scripture 
they help come alongside local indigenous leaders and help build the first orphanages, the first schools, the first hospitals. You go to Korea right now, and if you were to mention the names of the Underwoods or the Moffats, they will smile and say, let me treat you to a meal. <laughs> One of my greatest honors in my life was to be presented the Distinguished Alumni Award from the daughter of Dr. Samuel Moffat, Jr. But friends, hear me well. The whole gospel is not just Jesus is Lord and Jesus saves. For us to reduce the gospel simply to that is actually a false gospel. It's a limited gospel, a partial gospel, and in a country and context where there is so much individualism of me, myself, and I, my faith, my discipleship, my quiet time, my seminary, my walk with the Lord, friends, then we forget what it means that Jesus also cares about collective human flourishing. That just as it's true that Jesus loves you, that we should celebrate that Jesus revealing his lordship to people's life, we also must clearly and loudly declare that the world matters. That justice matters, that reconciliation matters, the poor matter, the hungry matters, refugees fleeing away from harm matter to God. That yes, black and brown bodies matter, migrant lives matter, children separated from their parents at borders matter to God. That's the whole gospel. One of the most dangerous questions that I have received as a pastor, I am so it grieves me to tell you that this question has been asked of me way too many times, and it goes like this. Pastor Eugene, what's more important, evangelism or justice? What's transpired in the church that these have become competing commands? Oh, what's happened in the movement of missions that we've seen these as binary things? Uh, friends, I, I know I'm not supposed to put God in a box, but just for the sake of this illustration, I want you to imagine a box on this podium. And this box represents the character of God. As we're speaking about the missional God, the character of God, if I were to extract love out of God's character, you would say, that's heretical. How can you remove love out of God's character? Heretic. God is love. If I were to remove grace out of God's character, the only reason why you and I have breath on this day is because of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It might not be something that we often speak of regularly, but if we were to remove holiness out of God's character, and the prophet Isaiah in his human finitude trying to grasp the infinitude of God. Isaiah can only repeat himself and says what? God, you are holy, holy, holy. So my question to the church, especially during these times, is what happened in the church that we've extracted justice out of God's character tossed it aside and called it an agenda. A political issue. Oh, we don't talk politics here. A progressive issue. I'm not saying that the work of justice is easy. It's clearly messy, but to extract justice out of God's character 
is completely antithetical to who God is and the God and the Jesus revealed in the scriptures. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I think, says it so, so profoundly. He says in one of his books, quote, a religion true to its nature must also be concerned about man's social conditions. Any religion that professes to be concerned with the souls of men and is not concerned with the slums that damn them, the economic conditions that strangle them, and the social conditions that cripple them is a dry-as-dust religion. That religion should die, especially during a time of disruption. Friends, I want to just share one last thing, and I know I'm past time, but I warned you there were three different sermons in this one sermon. <laughs> Missional leadership, 101, we all know this. It's never meant to be transactional. It has to be relational. After the killing of Michael Brown in August 2014, there was a, a survey, some research conducted about the state of relationships in America. And this is really interesting. This is really provocative. And we know that all surveys are imperfect. But in this survey, they give us a glimpse of the insular bubbles of friendships and relationships that exist in our nation, and yes, even in the church, and especially in the church. So in a hundred friend scenario, for example, the average white person has 91 white friends. One each a black, one Latino, one Asian, one mixed race, other races, and then three friends of unknown race. Let me go on. The average black person, on the other hand, has 83 black friends. Eight white friends. In part makes sense because of the populations. Two Latino friends. Zero Asian friends. What's up with that? <laughs> there is a very tense history in our nation going back to the L.A. riots. Three mixed race friends, one other race friends, and four friends of unknown race. For Asian Americans, it's also incredibly insular. So my question to you is this. How is it possible that the church or the nation can possibly engage in some of the most emotional, important, critical conversations, and yet we don't have relationships. Friends, this is why I'm moved by the words of John chapter 1, verse 14, according to the message translation where it says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. So God, thank you for your moving in our lives. We again come to you asking for the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit to work within us. Help us to listen, to hear, Help us to be people committed to the incarnational relationship. Help us, God, to demonstrate uh, faithfulness during these challenging, disruptive times. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
maybe. Yes, there we go. Thank you. Uh, another hand for Dr. Reverend Cho, or Reverend Cho, sorry, excuse me. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your important insights tonight. We're now going to take a few moments um, and field a few questions from our in-person participants and then from our online participants. Uh, so what questions or concerns or hopes do you have for Reverend Cho's uh, lecture? And I will uh, walk around with this, so feel free to stand. And if you were to ask a question, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself, that would be great. Special extra bonus points for the person who asks the first question. <laughs> Buenas noches, Reverendo Eugenio. It's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Felicia from Managua, Nicaragua. Um, one of the things that you highlighted in your presentation is the idea of relationship. I am working in the North Hills area in Pittsburgh. As familiar or not familiar with Pittsburgh, it's not exactly the most diverse community. <laughs> I probably am um, two, one or two people in the congregation that's actually Latina. And obviously the idea of, of community is something we're trying to build. Um, I know I don't want to ask, this is a long question, but how would you see creating that kind of community more engaging diversity in a denomination or at least in a congregation that is 95% white? Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. This is a, it's a great question. It's a hard question. I suspect that many of you have insights, thoughts, your particular angles and perspectives, and I'm not suggesting that I have all of the answers. Uh, but I think relationships take time. So that there's one, right? There's an element of t relationships that aren't overnight. And I find it to be so interesting that we're living in the most technologically connected time and yet the loneliest disconnected time in human history. Uh, we've lost the art of neighboring. Like there's something about what does it mean to be a good neighbor? Theologically, I want you to know that it's impossible to love your neighbors if you don't know your neighbors. It's just theological gymnastics at that point. But I also want to confess, it is hard actually building relationships with neighbors. Um, after the elections of the, uh, the two elections ago in 2016, uh, the election of President Trump was disruptive in many a ways. And uh, not that it's my intent to try to open that box here per se, but uh, I once heard the story about a couple uh, Asian women who were shocked by the election of President Trump. They live in Silicon Valley and they wanted to simply hear the other perspective and they realized that they knew zero people that thought differently than them. Zero. And so they put it out on social media that they wanted to host a dinner without the intent of screaming or shouting or arguing. They just wanted to break bread together with other people. And they did that. People responded. And the next thing you know, one thing led to another. And it began a movement called Make America Dinner Again. Amen. And so there are these chapters all around. I went to my chapter in Seattle. It was challenging because we were the whole point is you're talking about borders immigration abortion freedom of, of religion and the list goes on we didn't clearly solve everything but I think there's something about this idea that uh, we so f infrequently have an opportunity to humanize the stories that we're arguing about now I still have my convictions and I'm gonna contend for my convictions I want to do it without dehumanizing the people that I disagree with. So I, I, do, I do believe that the art of neighboring is really important. Uh, the second thing that I would say is that it's really important that we as people seek to be committed to representation. It's not the answer, right? It's not the answer, right? Just because you bring people of color or whatever it might be into leadership doesn't mean that it's going to guarantee anything 
but I've never seen, I think, radical equity take place without representation. So I think there's a commitment for us to say, how do we do this in a way that is not tokenizing, uh, but significant and reflective of values that we have? So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Reverend Cho, Asa Lee, Pittsburgh Seminary. Question for you related to this, the notion of in disruptive times, when things are disorienting, the pressure to homeostate, to return to homeostasis becomes stronger, right? What does it look like to lead radically to push with more disorientation away from homeostasis, right? And I'll use a biblical metaphor of my own, which is there's something about John preaching in the wilderness, which on one hand is disorienting for the people in Jerusalem, but on the other hand, John is creating a community in the wilderness, right? And so then what does it look like in these times to resist homeostasis, the pressure to, can we just go back to what we used to have when those days are over? Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. And um, I think that in itself is a great conversation that you and I and others can have because I think there's a tension that exists right now. Uh, another story that I would refer to and I have referred to is I think about what an amazing story it is that because of God's power, uh, the Israelites are freed from the bondage and oppression of Pharaoh. Uh, we should celebrate that. And yet, on this journey, there are some who begin to say, we want to go back to Egypt. And not only do they say, we want to go back to Egypt, but I find it so interesting in the Exodus account that in their disruption, the narrative of how they remember Egypt is beautified. We had all the meat that we wanted. It was all so good. We had air conditioning. I'm obviously making that up. But I mean, they begin to beautify their experience when it was very clear they were living and suffering bondage. It was antithetical to flourishing. So I think the first thing that we should acknowledge is the danger of going back to normalcy. Uh, and we've heard that so much, right? Like, we want to go back to normal, what it used to be. And, and Peter says, I want to go back to fishing. That was his normalcy. That was his, uh, um, I guess, foundation. So I think just acknowledging that what might be normal in itself could be the seduction that we have to be wary of. And I highlight that to be the first because I really think that's the most important thing because there's a battle of that narrative right now among institutions, among communities, in our nation. I mean, it's not just our nation. This is happening all around the world in many ways. Uh, going back to normal wasn't all that great for lots of people. So that's the first thing that I would say Maybe a word of caution would be that since you use the example of John the baptizer, I, I just find it so interesting. You know, if anyone should receive a special doctorate on Jesus, it would be John the baptizer. Like only he's done certain things. He baptized Jesus. And so we know that story, and I find it so interesting that at the existential moment of John the baptizer's life, even he went through a moment of disruption, right? That exchange where he sends, he's in jail. He knows something bad's about to happen. Right. He feels it in the air. He hears the stories. And so he sends his disciples to go to Jesus and ask the question. And this is mind-boggling to me. He says, ask Jesus the question, are you the one? Or shall we wait for another? Why? Because, yes, John the baptizer disrupted, but Jesus disrupted him. This is kind of my circuitous way of saying that 
during these times when I do believe it's really important for us to embrace our pastoral and prophetic voice. Uh, this is my concern about the Capital C Church. We have some leaders, all they're embracing is their pastoral voice, which is good. God is love, God is gracious, but they're saying, I'm going to not engage in our prophetic call. And by doing so, we're being unfaithful to our call as followers of Jesus. On the other hand, I think there are those who are embracing our prophetic call, but are losing what it means to also be pastoral, to reflect God's love. Like both of these are essential. So what I'm saying is before we say unto others, woe unto you, are we also simultaneously asking the question and reflecting, woe unto me? This is really hard stuff. It's hard work. So maybe not a robust answer, but those are some initial thoughts that come to mind for me. Any other questions? And a reminder to those online as well, there's, a, there's an option there. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Eugene. This is Pastor War Ujulu. <coughs> I am originally from Ethiopia, and the uh, fruits of great work of Don McClure. We call him Odan. He's a great man with conviction. When you go to my area, you ask about Odan, everyone knows him, as you mentioned, about people that penetrate that world. God has done great work in life. I'm here because of him. Mm. I've always joked that God brought me to Pennsylvania because he wanted me to be close to Don McClure's village in Blairsville. My question, um, when we t you talk about disruption, and it uh, looks like at this moment in life, uh, there is this di di disruption. I don't know whether retirements or withdrawal, as you say it, because the church, our church, the Presbyterian, seems to be withdrawing or retiring from the overseas. Uh, mission work. I know the last assembly we have this motto from lamentation to hope. Whether retirement or as I mentioned or withdrawal, what do you see? What will be the next step for us? Not to ignore the importance of going out I did my MD on uh, discipleship because what we are, Don McClure left with us is the church that governed itself, propagated itself. But we have to make sure that the word that he had preached, people continue to disciple each other. Yeah, thank you, Pastor, for sharing uh, a little glimpse of your story. Uh, we're so delighted that you're here. It's a pleasure to occupy the same space with you tonight. You know, just a couple initial thoughts come to mind for me. And um, um, I had a chance to be a pastor at a church in Korea. And I never imagined that as a seminarian from Princeton who took two years off to be an intern and because of circumstances I became a pastor there, that uh, a theology and a vision for the nations and multiculturalism and globalization would take place in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, we had worship services in 21 different languages led by indigenous leaders because back then it was right when the wave of globalization really began to grow. And so we had workers from all around the world. So I led the English service of that church. And the pastor there had this tremendous conviction about missions, both in word and deed, both, again, evangelism and justice. Like anyone that does missions, I believe that's a general statement, but 
when you're doing missions in whatever context, urban, rural, or international, you know that it's not just us coming with the Bible. Like, we know this, and we should never create that caricature that missionaries are coming simply having that unidimensional, one-dimensional. But he had this deep conviction, and the reason why I share this story and this is not to say that the movement of missions is dying or retiring here, but I do believe that the Western church is not the center of the global church. And that's been the case for a while. Publishing, influence, resources might be more plentiful here. But what I can tell you, as I'm sure you can as well, is having had the privilege of traveling to numerous nations around the world and meeting with pastors and missionaries in so many different places and contexts, when people here say God is on the move, this is not me trying to give you a marketing statement. I believe God is on the move. And the, 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 the crux, the center of the church. God still loves the Western church, is working here, uh, but God is also at work. And so I was shocked at the number of missionaries that are being sent out from other nations, including to the United States. I, I, I find it just very ironic that as they sent missionaries to other parts now, there are other nations so gripped and compelled uh, that they're sending missionaries to all over, including to the United States. One last story that I'll share with you. This is um, something that I wanted to share, didn't have time, but you know, most folks, unless you're a missiologist, but most Christians won't know that Pyongyang, the capital city of North Korea, uh, I, I don't know if they're still alive, but we have family that stayed behind. Uh, my parents, and my father was six years old when he fled south because of violence, persecution, and the rise of communism. Uh, when he was 82 years old, he told me for the very first time, at 82, told me that he had lived in a refugee camp, separated from some of his family members. And when I asked him, why didn't you ever share this story? In his imperfect English, he just said, something's too painful to share. But the reason why I mentioned Pyongyang is that um, uh, Pyongyang, according to nearly every missiologist, it was called the Jerusalem of East Asia. It was where? It was the center of the spirit movement around Asia. You go back to Pyongyang. And a lot of folks don't know this, but something took place. And the crazy part of the story is that something shifted and changed. You know, the dictators right now in North Korea, if you go back two generations, they were churchgoers. I mean, this is, this is really crazy stuff, but they were believers. And it was on Christmas Day. I want to make sure, this is a, a, a very... Uh, important theological institution. I want to get, make sure I get my, my, my statistics correct because this is really important. Uh, the shift in Korea happened in huh, on Christmas Day in 1949 when the dictator at that moment, Kim Il-sung, unveiled a humongous statue of himself and said, I'm God. And things shifted. But, East, but uh, Pyongyang used to be called the Jerusalem of the East. And uh, last thing that I'll share is, this is so fascinating to me, is that um, I have some friends who work with defectors from North Korea and Korea. In fact, the, one of the last trips that my wife and I took before the pandemic was in Seoul, Korea. We were meeting with about 40 missionaries that were all kicked out of China and North Korea. You guys remember, I don't know if you remember, but there was a moment when they were all kicked out. 
and they were just waiting to go back in, it's still closed. But I have friends who work with defectors, and one of the things that they learned of these defectors when they do these surveys as they come into South Korea, 90% of all these defectors were followers of Jesus. So as to say, God is still at work. Thank you so much. Yeah. Pastor Cho, this is our, yeah. our last uh, question. Great. Hello, I'm Pastor. Thank you for your talk. I'm Bill Quinn, Pastor Bill Quinn from Trinity Presbyterian Church in Fairhope, Alabama. Um, I can identify with your, I, I, I understand your father. My wife is from Taiwan, and they get a steady diet in Taiwan of stories from America about the assaults that happen, and, and, and so I can understand it. And so I'm curious, after you told the story about this, two parts to this, were you able to convince your father, and how do we convince 350 million people in America, whether Asian, white, black, that a gun will not save them? Mm. All right. So, hey, thanks for coming. Uh, we'll see you. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Uh, so I'm really confused, Pastor, because you're from Alabama. You're wearing a Montana State sweatshirt. Are you a Roll Tide fan? What, what, what's going on here? Are you an Alabama fan? Uh, well, I'm always asked Alabama or Auburn, and I say Penn State. Okay, all right. Okay, that's great. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, it's, a, it's such a, a, a great question. I'll, I'll obviously answer the first one. It was a very spirited conversation and uh, very emotional, and I basically just said no to him, and he was upset. He wanted me to take him to Cabela's to buy him a gun, and uh, so the conclusion of that story is eventually he agreed that it wasn't a good idea. Uh, this is probably recorded, and I'm gonna be in trouble, but uh, I needed to give him something because he just had this thing that I need to protect your mother. And so I refused to buy him a gun, so I did buy him a knife. Amen. And he just needed something tangible in that moment where he felt like I have to do something. And so that's that story. But I think to your question about, uh, you know, how do we convince people? Uh, you know, I'm not entirely sure because I think this is the overarching narrative. In fact, if you read some of the most recent statistics that have come out, uh, I just recently read an article about the skyrocketing amount of guns purchased among Asian Americans. It was mind-boggling to me. And I think it's just because our society really does function in that currency of fear. And the human thing, and so I always feel that as I look back at my conversation with my father, the one thing that I wish I had done is I wasn't a good pastor. Because if I was a good pastor at that moment, I would have first affirmed his fear. But I didn't. I just went at him. And I just think that there is so much fear, and for us not to affirm that fear denigrates the humanity of that fear. So that's the first thing that I would do. I don't think it's the answer to your question is how do we convince, but if we can just affirm that, yes, as a human being, like I understand a glimpse of it, why you're feeling this way, then that eases the opportunity to actually have a conversation. And as we have that conversation, then perhaps there might be an openness that they're not listening to an antagonist, but to a fellow neighbor who also cares about their flourishing. So I've actually had this conversation with people in Seattle. Because in Seattle, gun purchases have skyrocketed, which is really odd for a left-leaning progressive city. But the pandemic and all of these things have exasperated the situation. But I think we're talking with people that we not, we're not sure if these folks desire the flourishing of my life. Uh, this is part of the reason why I wrote that book, Thou Shalt Not Be a Jerk, because um, I was concerned that too many pastors 
either we were in bed with politics and political parties, or there was a large group of people that chose to refuse to talk about politics in the church. And they were fearful of politics. And I was trying to explain to them, you're not afraid of politics, you're actually afraid of partisan politics. They're different. Like, to be political is not partisan politics. So I'm trying to explain to them, politics matter because it informs policies that impact people. Every time I read the Bible, God cares about people. But in this conversation, I'm trying to explain to both my neighbors and pastors that uh, the reason why we have to have these conversations is that if we don't, people in the church, they're being discipled by someone else. They're being discipled, mean, and they are. We know this to be true. They are quoting your, you know, whatever political pundit that comes to your mind rather than, I think, a more kingdom-minded, subversive way of looking at things. And, and so that's the reason why, uh, how I would approach it. So, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Reverend Trill.